Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt. You know, my guest today is a queer multimedia artist working in the mediums of painting, sculptor, photography, modeling, and home decor. Her 60s psychedelic-inspired work showcased the beauty, freedom, and diversity she considers essential to establishing equity in the cannabis space and beyond. Her portfolio and commissions highlight her ability to adapt to different, uh, to different styles and aesthetics across spectrums of gender and sexuality while merging the cultures of cannabis and art. Emily Eisen, thank you so much for joining us today on Let's Be Blown Montel. Thank you so much for having me. This is like a huge honor and I'm just really happy to be here. Well, we're honored to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and when did you know you wanted to be a professional artist? So I grew up in Southern California in um, a little beach town um, called Manhattan Beach. And basically I didn't know I wanted to be a professional artist until it kind of happened. Um, I was really in the um, mindset that I was going to Washington DC to be an activist. I was just super into all kinds of activism when I was in high school. I started a feminist union at my you know, high school when being a feminist wasn't cool. So I've just been doing this a long time, but um, I didn't really know I was gonna be an artist until that Washington DC dream didn't really work out for me, but it led me to this, which is much better for who I am now. And wait, how did that dream not working out lead you to a professional art career? Okay, so basically I went to DC for um, college for political science. And then about a year into it, I just completely like, there was like a total lack of like creativity around me. Um, it was very much just that like Capitol Hill attitude and very cutthroat, very conservative. And what school were you going to? Shall not be named. Okay. All right. There you go. All right. <laughs> but um, yeah, but just a very like prestigious school in Washington D.C. That's what I'll say. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Uh, but that's actually I'm very grateful because that's where I found cannabis. Um, and my best friend actually, my roommate, she was the one that was like, "Come in the bathroom and smoke this with me." So I was like, "Okay." And then I tried it, and then. That's when like I really reconnected to the creativity I had growing up. It was just kind of a passion. Like I've always done art. Um, I've been shooting photography since I was 14 and discovered film photography. But I didn't know that it was going to be a career until I moved back home to Los Angeles and kind of just was like, what do I do now? The only thing I was passionate about is like cannabis and art. So that's when I became a butt tender. And to make a very long story short, I started as a bud tender at a bunch of different shops. This was pre-recreational uh, and pre-legalization. So things were still very like... They were still medical. That was when it was medical. Yeah, that was medical. But it was still very like sketchy, like in terms of you could go to work and then it would get raided and then, you know, you would get arrested. So it was like, it's pretty scary. Like I had to like convince my parents that like it was going to be okay. <laughs> but... Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit. That's right there. Slow down for a second. Let's talk a little bit more about that bud tender experience. Like before that, you were a your user yourself. Did you try to educate yourself? Did you try to study as much as you could about cannabis so that you were giving out information to people that you know, was correct or, or appropriate information? Exactly. Talk to me about your, your experience as a bud tender. So when I was a bud tender, um, that's what really introduced me to how this plant is so much of a miracle for so many people. And um, that's when I really learned a lot about the different strains of cannabis, different um, forms that people use it in their lives, whether it's, you know, an ailment or just um, anxiety or depression or whatever they're used for. There's so many people that came in for like so many different things. So me obviously wanting to give accurate information would kind of use these people as like case studies and ask them a lot of questions like how does this work for you so maybe the next person that comes in with that same issue i could you know recommend what worked for somebody else um and it's really just about connecting with people on like that personal level and if you're passionate about the plan you're like a real user which i definitely was i think it kind of just comes naturally to want to help people and want to turn people on to this amazing plant you know at the same time that it was uh 
groundbreaking learning experience for you. You had some negatives that you encountered as a bartender, right? Let's talk a little bit about that because this is also part of the bigger conversation about, you know, inclusiveness in this industry. Definitely. Um, the time that I became a butt tender, it was very much still that women were kind of just like props and ways of like marketing to sell to men. And if you were a butt tender, you kind of had to fit that mold. At least it's were, you, were you out then? Were you, uh, did you already identify? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was. And a lot, I encountered a lot of, you know, men not wanting to believe that it could be true that I'm, you know, queer. They're just kind of like, oh, well, you know, girl like you needs a man, you know, type energy that I was getting a lot and kind of just like people thinking that they could hit on me Virtue. because I was working, you know, at a shop. Mm -hmm. And um, did you go to your, your managers or anybody and talk to them about that? Was, it, was there support for you or was it just I mean, like, you know, not really. I mean, the only support that I really had was like the community of women that I was around because, you know, the bosses were men and they also kind of bought into the attitude of, you know, you guys are in my shop. You are going to, you know, you, if you have to flirt with the customers, flirt with the customers, like they're kind of on that end. Like they just wanted to kind of exploit people at that time. And there's still not really a lot of regulations around like, but tender rights or anything, but, um, or like unions. But I think the women that I was with and putting myself around who also happened to be like of a creative mindset. And those are the relationships that really stick out to me in the beginning as like my support, like who I would go to and just like my community. Do you, do you think it's still the same way right now? I mean, what do you think? What's your take on diversity in the cannabis industry right now? I mean, I don't necessarily, and and it uh, you know, wouldn't it doesn't matter to me if I walked into a dispensary. I wouldn't necessarily need to see anybody's identity or things worn on their sleeve. But do you think that there is diversity in the cannabis industry, especially for folks like yourself? I think yes. I think it's. It's gotten better, you know, optically. I think in the beginning, it was kind of just like a free for all in the industry has kind of caught up to like, okay, like people want to see diverse content and like, we're going to give it to them. And it's kind of just a standard now for a lot of brands. But I think what still hasn't really changed is like the top level of people in the industry. Like that's like where there's still the same kind of like greed. Um, not like barely any diversity and if there is it like doesn't include people of color that often and it's kind of just this boys club still that's like kind of how i've been putting it um but i think like i don't want to say at the bottom but like on the lower levels of the industry i think it's like really there's so many talented people that have come in and i'm just really grateful to you know be a part of them and i just want to uplift everybody to that level where it's not just diversity for diversity's sake. It's more like action and like this community is going to be different than every other industry by, you know, uplifting people instead of putting them down, I guess. I'm sorry, do you feel like the LGBTQ BTQ plus community has been fairly represented in the industry? I mean, no. Um, no, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of people recognizing that the cannabis rights that they have now really come from, you know, queer people and Dennis Perron and all these people who came before us who in the fight, you know, against AIDS really spoke up about how cannabis should be used medically and should be allowed to be used medically. And the fight for cannabis legalization has been a queer fight. And I don't think that's accurately represented by just, you know, putting a rainbow on your vape packaging or something, you know, it's just, I think in terms of diversity in general, it's gotten better in terms of optics, but in terms of actual like tangible change and like money, I don't think it has. And I guess you would feel the same thing way about women in the industry, because we do know that women uh, in an ownership or a leadership position represent probably, I think it's less than 5% of the people in the entire community. Um, See, I think, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's better. I, I, I want to always say that it's better because I don't think we're at the same place we were, you know, for better, or for worse. I, I think things have progressed socially maybe, but you know, in terms of corporate data, I don't think things have changed very much. Gotcha. Now, you know, when did you start, what, what, what prompted you to shift? I mean, you were always into art, you were always into photography, but what made you say, hmm, there's something I could do for this industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I, got, I honestly say I got into it at like the perfect time. It was right before this big boom of legalization and brands wanting to have actual, you know, marketing materials and things like that. Um, but basically, every, almost every like Instagram or, you know, marketing for, dispensaries at the time or cannabis brands in general were just so lacking in like beauty and like I was saying it's it was usually just a girl like in a bikini like you know pose posing which I'm not hating on but it's like it was for the male gaze like almost a hundred percent um but I kind of was just like I have you know the creativity to like make beautiful imagery you know and if So basically how like the actual story started was I was a bud tender and my manager at the time who happened to be another queer woman um, was like, hey, do you want to be the social media manager and content creator for our store? So I was like, yeah. So I went from being a bud tender to just going in and shooting uh, photography like every day, of like different products. There was like a little grow room in the back. So I would always just be like, plucking cannabis leaves and, you know, just creating these beautiful compositions um, with the product and like lifestyle imagery. And then it just kind of exploded and I started doing it for like three other shops. And then it kind of turned from social media content into like bigger campaigns and bigger projects. And now I'm like, just so in awe. I never would have thought that this would be my career is like, a cannabis artist or an artist in the cannabis industry. It's, I'm just really blessed. That's really incredible. And and now do you have your own business, your own company that represents multiple different dispensaries or represents different products? Do you like a marketing? I would say I would describe myself as more just like a freelance creative freelance artist. Um, And everything's just under, you know, my name, my studio, Emily Eisen. Um, if but, people were looking for people were looking for where would they go? EmilyEisen.com. Okay. And um and, and and what's is important to you to convey in your work besides diversity? Right. Like as I mentioned before, um when there wasn't any diversity, you know, diversity was great. And now there is a baseline of diversity in the industry. I think we have to take it beyond diversity and you know, into action and into tangible financial opportunities for people who aren't represented in this industry. So what I, you know, aim to do with my work, um, at least in the cannabis industry, any industry, to be honest, is to bring in people that, you know, I know, I see, I spend my time with that are deserving and just so have so much to offer this space, you know, and I think for me, my next step is really just kind of staying behind the camera a lot um, and using my lens to showcase the people that I, you know, want to see in in the industry and in the world that have something real to say. Well, tell me a little bit about some of the latest projects you've been working on. So I have been getting into more editorial photography. Um, I've been featured in many print publication so far and that's kind of like been the next step for me like even beyond cannabis i just want to pursue editorial photography as you know a main career but i think um i can't say right now what it is but i am coming out with my first magazine cover with a very iconic classic cannabis duo and it will be on stands in february so everyone keep an eye out for it and it was that was like the high I think of my career so far is being able to shoot cannabis legends for like a magazine cover. And and what inspired you to carry this kind of sixties theme throughout your work? It's honestly just my style. Um, I think 
I, even since I was young, I always just loved the aesthetic of like the sixties and seventies. Um, and just really admire the glamor that that era brought. And I, I mean, I like, to showcase the current cannabis user and current cannabis culture and put it in the context of like this love, you know, peace and love era that, and also civil, you know, change of the sixties. And really that's like the beginning of like this cannabis culture, you know, and I think it kind of goes along with the counterculture. I'd like to evoke those images in my work wow um now if people again wanted to just see some representation of what you do would they go up on that website you said emilyeisen.com yeah emilyeisen.com and my instagram is at emilyeisen also and that's just basically my portfolio everything's pretty much on instagram sure and and, and you know i having been in this business now for how long have you been doing this maybe what last five years or so yeah you, 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 I'm sorry, I, I chuckled when you said when I was young, but you know, you're pretty young right now, dear, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, if you had to put a crystal ball on, I mean, are you doing anything that you think right now could help move this industry forward in a sense of, of getting us closer to legalization or... Um, what, what, put your crystal ball on. What do you think is going to happen in the next year, two years, maybe even five years when it comes to the industry? I mean, I definitely think national legalization like has to happen. And before any industry can advance, you know, to legalization, I think before we even think about like profiting off of it, like we need to free all the cannabis prisoners and like set up roads so that they can like be at the forefront of this industry because i just think it's so unfair and that's what really needs to change for everything so i hope that you know by some of the projects that i do to raise awareness for um cannabis you know people who are incarcerated for cannabis um i've done two different campaigns now one with um corvain cooper who was in mm-hmm. life who was um in prison for life for cannabis and was pardoned and started his own cannabis enterprise. Um, so I think just highlighting stories of people like that. Um, I did another campaign with, um, house of wise, a CBD company to, um, help the family of this veteran who was, um, incarcerated for cannabis and now they're trying to rebuild their life. So just more projects like that, more awareness, towards the social justice aspect of it. And then I think once that's kind of addressed, like on a national level, then it's going to be booming and it's going to be as common as alcohol. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when we're just to hear you talk, have you been involved with the last prison project? Yes, I have. That was um, the campaign with um, Sean and Ebony Worsley, which was uh, the veteran and his partner. Mm -hmm. They, house of wise partnered with last prisoner project so all the profits from that um product went to last prisoner project who then um gave it to the worsleys well i mean it seems to me like you would it, it would be interesting to to even put together a book with just the faces uh, you go in and shoot the faces of people all over the country and wow. pay them for for you know for um nonviolent cannabis possession charges and just have a book that had maybe a hundred faces in it that people could look at and see the diversity among those who have been arrested. Oh my gosh. I might just Still take it. that idea and run with it. Yeah, you, know? right, you got to. Dude, right? I got your co-sign on that and I'm I'm just gonna do it because that's for you. I you got my permission. I'm sorry it wasn't my idea. I was I stole that idea out of your head. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. I'm here so. for it. I'm giving it back to you. I, I, while we while you were talking, I could I could just honestly see someone who's got an eye like you have for aesthetics that you know. Unfortunately, you know because we only show the well. Well, one of the problems is the fact that in the last eighty years in the United States, 
you know, 75% of the people arrested for nonviolent cannabis crimes have been people of color. So the presentation to the world is one of people of color. And right. so therefore, a lot of people don't give a damn, you know what I mean, to be honest with you. But I mean, I would think a person like you who could go out and take pictures of people as diverse as they could look and then package them together. Right. I just want to amplify like those right. voices and those stories and use whatever platform I have to like get people, you know, who look like me to understand that there's like modern slavery in this country in the, you know, prison industrial complex and it's unfair and it needs to change like now, like yesterday. Yeah. I mean, I've often spoken on the fact that, you know, the, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act was really just a re-enslavement tool um, used to go ahead and incarcerate black people to get them off the, off the streets. I mean, it, it literally black and brown people off the streets. So, you know, I'm so glad that uh, you're working so hard. And again, you have a brand new cover of a magazine, National Magazine, coming out? Yeah, it's actually with um, Leaf Magazine. I can say the magazine. Um, Leaf Magazine, and it will be on stands and in dispensaries and online February 1st, I believe. So Emily, I mean, I, do you consider yourself Generation X? What are you, what, what, you know, they, we got so many terms these days, I can't keep up. So what, what are you? I am a millennial Gen Z cusp, but I'm like right <laughs> at the border. I was born in 1997. So, you know, I remember what it was like before the internet, but I also, you know, blend in with Gen Z. Sure. Way, so. Well, you know, I mean, now, what do you think about the fact that, and, and here we are, we're sitting here 2023 and trying to convince, you know, those in leadership to do the right thing. And that is to let's just deschedule and allow for cannabis consumption. There's a lot of people in your generation who are consumers. They've literally made the right choice. They made a choice to turn away from alcohol, and turn towards cannabis. Yet they are silent. You know what I mean? They don't step up to the plate as much as I think they should. What do you have to say to them about to convince them that become more involved, be a little bit more active so that we can finally break the stigma and let this 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 uh, cannabis out of the, the fence? Hmm. I might push back on the question okay. just a little okay. bit. Um, sure. You know, no disrespect. To no, 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 no. Go ahead. Anybody. Um, but I, I, I think you know the younger generation is, especially Gen Z, is so social justice focused, and I think you know the, almost to that's what people think of our generation as is like, oh, these woke, you know, Gen Z people. Right. I think I think it's more maybe your generation who hasn't moved the ball and who are in the positions of power and have been for, you know, decades. You got it. You got to Now, now I'm not going to push back. I'm just going to, going to, let's talk about that. It is because of my generation, the baby boomer generation, those born in, I think the late fifties to the early sixties that have now ascended to positions in legislations across the country that are the ones putting the bills forward okay to make it legal i mean if without my generation and who remembers who remembers sneaking a joint under the bleachers and hiding it right now they're sitting here successful and they go well it didn't really stop me so they're the ones who were actually putting the legislation forward and that's not, I'm not, I'm not arguing it. I'm just saying that I think that they're interested, but, I, and I'm also going to say you're right. Your generation is extremely active and woke on a lot of issues, but I don't see a lot of them down carrying the signs or stepping into city council meetings and saying, let's knock off the stupid draconian laws when it comes to cannabis. Okay. Well, I might be wrong. I might be wrong because you know. Oh, no, I hear you. I hear you. Um, I, I definitely agree. I think a lot of people from my generation maybe think some ways that are towards progress, maybe don't act or, you know, or 
are just very active online and not in the streets. I don't know what needs to change. I think I just would call to all my generation, you know, if you're going to enjoy this planet, you're going to know who paved the way and who has, you know, taken the, the devastation of the war on drugs. So I, I think I, no matter who you're talking to, whether it's, you know, someone who's been around since the beginning or someone who's just coming in now, I think there's a certain level of history that just needs to be taught and then action to go along with it. Yeah. I, I just think that we just got to get people to st- you know, I, I, with as much, oh, we have 38 states in the District of Columbia that have passed some form of legislation to allow for cannabis. It's like, I think right now I'm just your generation, my generation, everybody in between, I think needs to step up to the plate, be counted, stop acting like I move. Mean, we know that in the year 2021, $25 billion worth of cannabis was sold in the legal market across the country. That's more than the amount of milk sold in sold in grocery stores. That's more than energy drinks across the board. Yet, you know, you look at the news or you watch what's going on, you don't see a lot of activism out here. This is not going to continue to progress unless we all come together and say, yes, I smoked yesterday and damn it, I don't care what you think about it. But, period. period. But, so I don't know. But I, but I appreciate that. I appreciate your point. Yeah, I, I think, you know, every generation is a beneficiary of this planet. And I think the division between you know, the generations needs to just come together because with both of the power of the people and the power of the, you know, Gen Xers or boomers or whatever you want to say, empower the older generation mixed with this, you know, grassroots energy that Gen Z has. I think if that came together, knock it out the park. Unstoppable. Yeah. I agree with you. Well, look, I wish you so much good luck and, and success in what you're doing. And I'll be looking for your works. Thank you so much. And I would love to shoot you one day. So sure, we'll, we'll make that happen. Let's make it happen. Okay, for sure. I, you know, are you in California primarily? Yes. All right. Well, you know, I mean, I'm coming out, you know, I'll, t- I'll tell you how this ball is moving in, and I get to see it in different ways. And I have products in the marketplace up in Massachusetts. I'm getting ready to have products in the marketplace in Georgia and several other states. So I get to see cannabis from different perspectives. You know what I mean? We, we think that the South is going to be so conservative, but the South, you know, has been one of our leaders in cannabis for a long time. People don't know that. You know, there was something that was called the Cornbread Mafia out of Kentucky uh, back in the early 60s, uh, mid-60s, that was probably uh, responsible for the majority of cannabis sold in America. Most people think it was Humboldt County in Northern California. No, 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 no. You know, wow. Kentucky was one of the biggest growers of cannabis back in the 60s and distributors of cannabis around the country. Um, so getting a chance to look at it from different perspectives, I'm going to be speaking next month at, you know, a major uh, conference on brain science and neurology. And I've been asked to address some of the issues of cannabis there. And I'm like, you know, wow. So finally, it's at least acceptable to talk about and so when I'm in California, I'll make sure we reach out. Maybe if you want to shoot, maybe we'll do something while I'm there. I would love that. And, you know, thank you for all the work that you do personally to advance the cause. And you are very inspiring. And it's just so great to have a chance to connect with you. So thank you. Thank you. Really nice to meet you, too. You take care of yourself. You stay well. And I'm going to make sure that everybody give out that website one more time. EmilyEisen.com. EmilyEisen.com. You can go up there and see some of Emily's work and see how she literally is painting a new face to the entire cannabis industry. Wow. I like that. I'm going to steal that too. You got that, girlfriend. I'll keep giving you, I'll I'll throw you a million of them, okay? Okay. Thank you. So super. No, I'm glad. I'm so, so glad that you're here. Please keep us in mind if you have new projects that are going up or coming about that you want to talk about. You always have a home here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely, for sure. And make sure you keep tuning in to Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.
Thank you.